Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pub Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Alan Stein Jr., who is in Maryland today. How are you doing, Alan? I'm fantastic, John. Thanks, man. Absolutely. And Alan's a corporate performance coach and world-renowned speaker, and he spent the last 15 or so years uh, working with some of the highest performing basketball players on the planet. And now he has brought all of this together in a book, uh, Raise Your Game and Learning from the Best of the Best. So, um, Alan, maybe we start off by saying, you know, when people hear of things like a performance coach, what, what does a performance coach really do? Well, I spent the first part of my career, as you mentioned, as a performance coach in basketball, where my goal was to help improve players' athleticism, uh, their mind-body connection, uh, help bulletproof their bodies so they'd be resilient to injury. Uh, so really laying the physical foundation required for them to perform their skills at the highest level. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I didn't change my title when I moved over to the corporate space right. uh, because now I'm, I'm trying to help folks improve their performance, uh, whether it's an executive team trying to improve leadership performance or a sales team trying to improve sales performance. It's still about trying to improve performance. Right. And one of the things that interests me, so um, the book is Raise Your Game, uh, high, high Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best. So when somebody hears that and goes, well, yeah, I get it, uh, you know, a top athlete and they have all this time and all this money and, you know, they can work with somebody like you. But when you take it down into the corporate space for individuals, what, what do you think is really holding people back from you know, being the best that they can be. Well, it's exactly the stuff that they can and should be learning from these athletes, which is mindset, uh, the habits, the routines, the rituals, the disciplines. Uh, it's the little things that, that those world-class performers do on a daily basis. Uh, that is, uh, you know, one of the reasons that they're so successful. Uh, of course, in a sport like basketball, I mean, there's the physical talent component. Sure. I mean, no, no one would argue that a guy like LeBron James was born with some physical tools that most people weren't born with. Uh, but when you step outside of the sports arena, then those things become irrelevant because it doesn't matter, you know, uh, how tall you are, how athletic you are to be a world class sales professional. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually means that the the habits and the routines and the mindsets and the disciplines uh, become even more important because those are things that you can control and those are things you can influence. Yeah, absolutely. And I see, um, and this always fascinates me because chapter one of your book is self-awareness. And in all my years of being in business and um, managing and leading organizations, and that is, that's the one thing. It's a hard thing to develop for yourself is some self-awareness and, you know, that's a painful process, but it's really difficult when other people don't have self-awareness. So how do you help people with that whole issue of gaining some level of self-awareness? Because for me, that's the biggest part of the battle. Absolutely. And you know what's funny is uh, self-awareness, uh, it's kind of like driving. Nobody readily admits that they're a bad driver, <laughs> but clearly if you go out on the highway, you'll see plenty of them. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would ever openly admit that they're not self-aware, but there's a good percentage of the population that isn't. Uh, so first and foremost uh, is getting people uh, to have the humility and the openness to acknowledge that they might not be as self-aware as they need to be. And, and it's also important to uh, mention that self-awareness is not something that you arrive at. It's mm -hmm. it's a continual process. Sure. I mean, uh, I am more self-aware than I was a year ago, but I, I wouldn't wake up this morning and put a stake in the ground and say, I've arrived, I'm self-aware, mm -hmm. because the moment you do that, then you no longer are. <laughs> so it's a continuous process, and, and folks are at just at different spots on the spectrum. So first is having the humility and openness for them to acknowledge that they they can be more self-aware. Uh, and then again, to have the humility uh, and openness to acknowledge that they can use some help and some coaching to refine that. And, mm -hmm. and for me, uh, it actually took going through a divorce a few years ago uh, to go in for some counseling and some therapy to have someone, a professional, a medical professional, open my eyes to the fact uh, that I wasn't near as self-aware as I thought I was, because, you know, n we can't see our blind spots. Sure. That's why they're blind spots. But the key to self-awareness is simply acknowledging that you have them. Right. I know I have blind spots now, and that's where I can rely on my inner circle and my trusted family and friends and colleagues to help me see the things that I can't see. And, and really uh, what I believe self-awareness is, is how you view yourself is in harmony and alignment with how the rest of the world right. sees you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for someone that would not be self-aware, a perfect example that I use only from personal experience 
was the skill of listening, which mm -hmm. may be the most valuable skill when it comes to selling uh, and for leadership. Uh, but I used to think I was a great listener. Uh, but once I started asking the people that knew me the best and that were the closest to me, uh, they didn't agree. So <laughs> I was seeing myself in one light and they were seeing me in a different light. And that that disconnection uh, is why I wasn't particularly self-aware. Mm -hmm. So uh, funny enough, in order to attain real self-awareness, you often have to ask the people that know you the best. Right, right. And it's uh, and, uh, yeah, and it's, sometimes it's not a pleasant experience. But for me, it's one of the most uh, fundamental life-changing experiences when you start to develop some level of self-awareness and you're able to you know, look at some of the things you're doing and, and listen. The other thing I like uh, that you mentioned, too, is your coachability, right? So when it comes to everybody would agree, oh, yeah, you know, I understand why sports teams have coaches and coaches are great. I understand why, you know, somebody coaches me on my golf swing or whatever it is you do. But when it comes to work, um, sometimes we're very resistant to coaching i mean have you found that when you work with, it's something that as as adults when we're in our profession eh, we're not so we're not so geared towards co being allowed to be coached i have noticed that and and it's a shame because all high performers have coaches. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter if you, you could be talking about Tom Brady in the NFL, or you could be talking about someone like Beyonce. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone that wants to perform at a high level uh, has to have the confidence to know that they've put in the work to deserve to be successful, but blend that with the humility to acknowledge that they can still get better. And there are people that can help them get better. You know, when, when I left the basketball world uh, a little over two years ago to go into the corporate space, uh, I hired a speaking coach. Mm -hmm. I hired a writing coach. I actually hired a sales coach, someone that could teach me, uh, not any tricks, not anything sure. to be manipulative, but how I could best leverage the value that I could bring to others and the best way to get that across. So uh, I'm a huge believer in, in having coaches to help you improve any area that you want to improve. And, you know, it's, it's always, as you mentioned so perfectly, I mean, it's always been a part of sport, uh, but it needs to be a part of business. And, mm -hmm. and as I have been stepping in the corporate space, I mean, I have some wildly successful friends that are, that are CEOs and, and right. executives and they have coaches, they mm -hmm. have executive coaches and people that, that still help them. So, uh, I think the, that I, I keep coming back and I, I sound like a broken record, no. but hu humility and openness are the keys to being coachable. That's what being coachable is. It's saying, yep. I don't have all the answers and I'm going to acknowledge that someone else may, and I'm going to be open mm -hmm. to their coaching and their mentorship. And anyone that wants to perform at a high level needs to have that characteristic. Yeah, because at the end of the day, obviously, I mean, the coach, a coach, a good coach can see things that you can't see. I mean, that's why, I mean, that's why, you know, Tiger Woods at the top of his game still had a coach, right? Absolutely. I mean, Coach couldn't hit the ball as well as he could. Tiger Woods could hit it, but he could certainly point out how Tiger could hit it better. Yes. And elite performers, they crave that. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy like Tiger, he was so happy when he would when he would find a little hitch in his stroke because he knew as great as he was when he fixed that he'd be even greater. Mm -hmm. So it's almost good news to them to find out something that they can improve. Now, of course, uh, the better you get at your craft and the more elite performer you are, then the fewer there are of people that can actually help you get better. You know, it's one of the reasons that the, the U.S. men's Olympic basketball team was so open to Coach K, who was a college coach, coaching them because he had proven to them that he could still add value to their game, that he right. could still help them get better. Uh, because the moment you work with a high performer and you don't have anything that can get them better or they don't trust or believe in you, then they're not going to be open to your coaching. So, you know, if you're a, a freshman in high school and you're still learning the game and you don't know a whole lot, yeah, pretty much anyone in basketball can probably help you get better. Right. When you ascend to the top and you're mm -hmm. Steph Curry, there's only a handful of people on the planet that can have something that will add value to your game. So it just becomes increasingly more difficult to find those people, but the best, I mean, they search relentlessly for them. Mm -hmm. And then if you turn on the flip side, you know, the part two of your book is it talks about the coach themselves, right? So that's that's always an interesting thing is that, Take sales, for instance. Everybody will say, oh, your sales manager, sales leader, one of your biggest jobs and your most, most critical pieces is to be a coach to your people. But nobody teaches you how to be a coach. And it doesn't come naturally to, I would say, 99.9% .9 of people, right? Yes.
Absolutely. And really, I mean, a coach is going to be someone that's there to fill other people's buckets. That's going to be there to support. They're certainly going to be there to lead. Uh, they're, they're there to do anything and everything that their team needs them to do. So uh, a sales manager, uh, it's going to be different for everyone on their team. Uh, some people may need more uh, help executing a strategy. Some people may need, need more of a pep talk and some support. Uh, someone else. So it, it's part of it is being having the emotional intelligence to be chameleon-like enough to know what your people need so that they can perform at their highest level. Because that's what a coach is. They're basically a bridge to higher performance. And that will take many different shapes and it'll depend on who you're working with, uh, but that's what a good coach does. And yeah, when it comes to sales, uh, having somebody uh, to coach you to higher performance is is vital. Because many people, uh, you know, when they come into a leadership or management position, say, you know, like in sales and they say, okay, I need to be a coach. They start to think, they, they get that confused with, I need to have all the answers and I need to be directive, right? Which isn't coaching, right? No, absolutely. Uh, in fact, you know, whether it's sales or it's leadership or it's mm -hmm. coaching, um, one, one of the best tools you have in your toolbox is the ability to listen and to ask the right questions. So it's, it's not really about giving answers to your team. It's about asking them the right questions so that they find the right answers within themselves. Uh, and yes, sometimes if you're a subject matter expert, you'll have the answers and you'll have some, some intellectual knowledge that you can share with them. Uh, but one of the worst things a coach can do is to do everything for their mm -hmm. team. And, and, you know, the, the best coaches I've been around, even in basketball, a perfect example would be, you know, you're at practice and you're coaching, uh, and a player makes a bad pass and it's a turnover, you know, a, a rather novice coach will stop practice, scold the player and right. tell them what they should have done where mm -hmm. a, a much wiser and more experienced coach will stop basically ask the player and say, I'd like to know what you were thinking at that time. Like d share with me what, why you thought that was the best pass to make. And then let's bring in some of your teammates and ask them what they thought. Maybe they have a different perspective and ask questions and get them to come up with the answer. Cause when you do that enough, now you're teaching decision-making, mm -hmm. which is one of the most important skills that we can have in sales or in sports. Mm -hmm. And then the player will say, wow, you know, you're right, coach for a split second. I thought that was the right pass, but if I would have taken one more dribble, the big man underneath would have been open and that would have been a much easier basket yet. Next time that's the play I'll make. And now they have some ownership. They understand the mistake they made. They're going to learn from it and move on it is a much better way to coach. And same thing from a sales standpoint, mm -hmm. ask your people the right questions and get them to figure out the answers. Uh, and that will help them with decision-making, but it will also help build confidence, which is crucial in both sales and in sports. For sure. So let's talk about that confidence piece because, um, you know, that, that's also one of the toughest things. I mean, it's great to say, come on, you should be more confident. You need to believe in yourself and everything, but that's, you know, they're just words. How do you really build both the confidence confidence, confidence in the person, confidence in the team, even confidence in the coach themselves. Confidence comes from one thing. It comes from demonstrated performance. Mm -hmm. it, it comes from putting in the work to know that you deserve the right to be successful. So uh, one, you've got to have to, to put the work in first. Uh, but then as a coach, you want to put your team in a position where they can taste some confidence, where they can taste some success. You put them in a position where they can demonstrate performance at something, and then you continue, continually level up from there. Uh, right. But that's the only thing that it comes from. So it's a matter of, you know, if you have a, a new salesperson on your team that may lack confidence, um, and, and I'm, you know, just making this sure, up sure. off the cuff, you know, maybe you give them some of the easier accounts or you give them some of the sales that, that would probably come easier to them. Not implying that anything mm -hmm. is easy, but you, you lob them a couple softballs so that they can start to build that confidence muscle and start to say, okay, you know, I do belong here. I can do this. And then over time level up and, and, and that's how you get, you, you know, you got to get in your reps and you get your confidence, whether you're the coach or you're the player. And then collectively over time, when everybody's confidence is starting to rise, uh, then the team's collective confidence will rise uh, in alignment with that. So let me ask you a question. When you moved over from, you know, from doing this in, in, in basketball and sports into the corporate arena, was there anything that, that surprised you or something that you found was very different or did you find it very similar? 
I found it very similar. I mean, the transfer and the crossover is is almost identical. I mean, yes, there's a few nuances uh, that aren't. And, and the strategy of what it takes to win a basketball game is not identical to the strategy uh, of what it takes to, to have a thriving company. But the overarching principles are the same. My biggest surprise, though, was how many of these things – I guess I had taken for granted or become mm -hmm. numb to because I grew up in the sports world because there's a lot of businesses out there, incredibly successful ones that aren't doing these things. Mm -hmm. And, and it was shocking to me that I could go in and, and meet with a company that was doing a hundred million dollars a year in sales. And they had all sorts of dysfunction in their culture. Their meetings were chaotic. People didn't know what their roles were. There was poor leadership. And I'm not saying this uh, to judge or to diminish. Sure. I was just shocked that they could reach that level of success in spite of their habits and environment instead of because of them. And it's, it was just kind of crazy that, that, you know, I've been a part of a high school program where a high school basketball coach, uh, has all of this stuff humming along <laughs> like a well-oiled machine. And I can go into a hundred million dollar company and see that that's not the case. Uh, but the good news is, and this is how I position it very, very much like Tiger Woods in his heyday looking for something to improve. I tell them that that's great news. Hey, yeah. you guys are doing a hundred million dollars in sales and you've got a lot of problems going on. Imagine once you patch those holes mm -hmm. up and you tighten those screws and you refocus the lens. I mean, you guys will be a billion dollar company when you start doing things the way they need to be done. So I always choose to view these things um, yeah. as a positive and that's what it is. But that was probably the biggest surprise was the fact that I had taken things for granted in the sports world that a lot of people in the business world uh, weren't doing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, when I used to run a sales consulting company that um, it, it, we used to do spin selling, that was one of the things that used to surprise me because sometimes we'd go into huge global corporations and some of the our, our more basic stuff, I'd be kind of embarrassed for us to even present it until people said, oh, yeah, we're not doing that. And then yeah. you're like, what? Really? So it is, it is amazing. And I think that's probably part of it is that um, when you have these conversations with uh, with corporations is getting them to take a breath, right, and say, OK, we can take a step back and fix some of these things as opposed to where it's like, we're, uh, we're, we're just so busy moving. We don't have time to fix stuff. Right. And and one of the major pillars, not only of the book, but of all of my talks and trainings and workshops is, is the lesson that I learned from Kobe Bryant back in 2007, which is never get bored with the basics. No matter how good you are at sales, there are basic principles of what you need to be able to influence and impact people, of what you need to be able to solve problems for them. You know, when when I had these sales mentors with me, uh, that was one of the things that they told me was, you know, you're not really selling anything. What you're doing mm -hmm. is solving a problem. Right. And if you ask the right questions, you'll lead them down the path to see that your product or your service is the right fit for them and it will solve their problem. Mm -hmm. And 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 that mindset yeah, has, has been invaluable. But that's that really is what it comes down to. Yeah, and I think one of the things is, and I think a lot of people are guilty of it, we've probably all been guilty of it at times, though, is that we don't invest enough in ourselves, right? So your day-to-day -day job, whatever it is, whether it's sales, is the thing that puts bread on your table. Now, if you're to be honest with yourself, you know, you may spend more time on your golf swing, practicing your golf swing than you ever do practicing your sales skills. One of them, if that could put bread on your table you'd be doing it professionally right now and um, the other thing is what is actually but you're not investing in it so i think a part of it comes would you agree is that we have to look at ourselves and say we're responsible first and foremost for investing in ourselves oh we absolutely are and that's the very first step to improving any team is to improve yourself mm -hmm. that would be the that would basically be my sign off to the the high school programs i worked with when the kids were leaving for the summer was if you want our team to be better uh, when school starts, then you need to come back better when school mm -hmm. starts. And, and it's important for folks to realize that. But you know, what's interesting is, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, especially with sales, people probably don't know how to practice to mm -hmm. get better at sales. Like their practice is when they're in front of a client yep. or when they're writing a proposal. And you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in role playing in situations and, and practicing these different things. So if you and I are teammates and we work for a sales organization, you know, we should carve out, you know, 30 minutes every Monday morning and do some different situations where you be the client or the prospect and I'll be the sales professional. And then we can switch and come up with all sorts of different objections, come up with different, you know, just practice that. I mean, that's what sport does. The best coaches 
make make their practices as close to game like as possible so that there's there's maximum crossover mm-hmm. when the game actually counts and it should be the same thing from sales and and some people you know that may feel a little hokey to them a little cheesy you know cuz you're kind of acting and sure. okay i have to pretend to be a disgruntled prospect but once you can get over mm-hmm. uh, the the cheesiness if you will those things are invaluable. Yep. You know, you don't want the first time you hear uh, a question or you hear some type of rebuttal to be when you're actually making this sale, especially if it's a big one. If you sell mm-hmm. high ticket price items, you know, you don't want that to be the first time you've ever heard of this um, any more than a coach wants to see a defense for the mm-hmm. first time when they're actually playing. So I'm a big believer in in role pr- playing and practicing these skills over and over because that's the only way you get better at anything no, is repetition, repetition, repetition. I agree. And actually, you know, they have proved psychologically that your brain will recall. We could do a role play, a simulation, if you like. And later on, your brain will recall that as a as something real, not as they won't differentiate and say, oh, that was a role play. They'll just recall that as a memory of something real. So it does it can really contribute towards, um, you know, real life situations. So people shouldn't see it as just, uh, you know, simulating. These are things that can really help you. For sure. And, you know, what, what you can do, too, is, you know, if, if your sales team has a, a, a weekly meeting, you know, every Monday morning at nine, we have a meeting, you know, a portion of that meeting should be reviewing last week and mm-hmm. saying, OK, guys, uh, who had a, a sales call or a sales meeting or a proposal that went really well, that you closed the deal? And is there anything that you can share maybe outside of the obvious that helped you do that? You know, are there some best practices mm-hmm. you can share with the rest of us so we can do more of that? Conversely, uh, if any of you laid an egg last week, any of you got shut down or turned down, uh, you know, within something that was within your control. Yeah. And is there a lesson that you learned? If if you could do that call over again or have that meeting again or write that proposal again, is there something you would have done differently now that it's in the rearview mirror that you could share with us? And if we're constantly sharing our, our successes and our challenges then we learn from each other. So if, if you had a very tough sales call last week and you learned a hard lesson, why should I wait until the same thing happens for me to learn the same lesson? Why don't I just learn from you because you're my teammate mm-hmm. and now I'm better armed in the future uh, if that comes up? And, and that's the type of stuff that, that I would love to see more often with sales teams is role playing and these general mm-hmm. discussions where we're bringing this stuff up and, and look at it almost like it's a practice. Yeah. This is our weekly practice, and we're going to spend 60 minutes getting better every Monday because these are the things that we're going to focus on. And uh, man, uh, and, and sales professionals that have been doing this forever, they could probably write 50 index cards yep. of of different challenges or rebuttals or weird situations, and that's what you can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and you and I partner up. We pull one card out of the file. You're the prospect. I'm the you know I'm the salesperson. I read it. This is what we're going to act out. And let's go. Mm-hmm. And you can have some fun with it. Let yeah. you do it in front of the group. Let them offer, you know, their thoughts. Uh, turn it into some fun. But that's how you improve sales performance. Yeah. And not to mention when you do role play and you play the role of a customer, you actually then start to appreciate the mindset of a customer better as well. So there's a dual um, benefit from it. You're not just uh, practicing the sales skills, but also realizing what it's like to be on the other side of the table. Because for some reason, we tend to forget that when we come into work, we could be in the shop five minutes ago as a consumer and come into work and forget what it's like to be a consumer. So well said, Mm -hmm. because that's what empathy is. Mm -hmm. And empathy is one of the most important tools we have in sales or in leadership. Very, very well said. Absolutely. Well, listen, um, this has been fantastic. But before we go, I wanted to give you a chance, Alan, to tell the people a little bit more about yourself, where they could learn more about you and find out more. Sure. Well, if they're interested in the book, uh, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. They can go to Raise Your Game Book. Dot com, uh, and it's actually been resonating really well with sales organizations. I've had a bunch mm-hmm. of previous clients order it for their whole team uh, and, and can do kind of a, a read-along. Some of them are adding that to their weekly meetings where they'll all discuss a chapter by chapter each week. Uh, and then anything else that I have going on from a speaking standpoint, uh, you can find it at allensteinjr.com. Uh, and I'm very active on social media, uh, Instagram and LinkedIn and, and Twitter, uh, at allensteinjr as well. And I love engaging with folks. So if anyone... Uh, you know, saw or heard this and something resonated and you'd like to discuss it further, please drop me a line on social. I'd be honored to do it. Yeah. And and you just have to go on Amazon. You can see how many reviews the book has. You can see the uh, testimonials. You see Kevin Durant, who you did a lot of work with. 
um, saying this is a must read book. And I love that. And I'd like to finish. I love that one. Just repeat that thing that Kobe said to you again, because I think that's so critical for everybody to listen to. Well, he, he told me that the, I asked him why he was the best player in the world because I had watched him practice mm -hmm. early morning and he was doing a lot of basic moves and basic footwork. And I was shocked because I figured the best player in the yeah. world was doing the fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. And he looked me in my eye and said, the reason I'm the best is because I never get bored with the basics. And, right. you know, I try to apply that to every aspect of my life, whether it's business, whether it's basketball, uh, whether it's being a father, whether it's being a friend, whatever it is. The basics work and they always have and they always will. But what's so important for people to realize that just because something's basic, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Yes. A lot of people think those are synonyms and mm -hmm. they're not. No. You know, what it, what it takes to sell anything is incredibly basic. But mm -hmm. as most of your listeners know, selling is anything but easy. It's an incredibly hard vocation, but it's basic. So if you keep working on the basics and mastering the basics – you, you'll you'll raise your performance and you'll you'll raise your game <laughs> well thank you thank you alan this has been fascinating it's fantastic and i hope people take that away never get bored of the basics um been a pleasure talking to you hopefully you come back and talk to us again soon uh, my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine pipeliner crm see you all for another expert inside interview really soon thank you thank you